We've picked up a lot of new info in the last couple of weeks about Horizon Forbidden West and it looks like a banger of a game is inbound for us. So I'm going to break down everything new we know so far and get you up to speed in a 10 things you need to know format so you're prepared for the Forbidden West on launch. So let's one dive in. So first up, release date, when can we play? Well, we now have the Ironclad and official launch date of Friday, February the 18th. And thanks to PlayStation Game Size on Twitter, Forbidden West looks to provisionally be around a big boy 95 gigabytes with a potential preload date of February the 11th so you can get it downloaded and ready to go a week before launch. Now you've also got four game editions to choose from. In fact, if you pre-order any physical or digital editions from specific retailers, you're going to pick yourself up a Nora Legacy outfit and spear to use in game, which look pretty cool. However, if you fancy dropping a little bit more cash, then the special collectors and regala editions have a myriad of different goodies available depending upon how much you actually want to spend. So definitely worth a perusal. We do have good news though, because if you're still waiting on that elusive PS5, then no problem because Sony and Gorilla have officially stated that you can buy the PS4 edition and then upgrade it to the PS5 edition for free, boosting the game to that delicious 60 FPS and 4K image quality. Interestingly, Sony were initially going to charge us $10 to upgrade from the PS4 to the PS5, which they've subsequently done a U-turn on after some intense community feedback, which means that if you own a PS5, you can go ahead and buy or pre-order the PS4 version and then just upgrade it to the PS5 version for free, saving yourself $10 in the process, which is pretty sweet. Now as for the story, what is this game all about? Well, very briefly recapping Zero Dawn before I explain Forbidden West, the Horizon games themselves are set a thousand years from our present day after a global catastrophe involving self-replicating robots that wiped out human civilization. At the time, to prevent this from happening, a top secret project called Zero Dawn was spearheaded by Elizabeth Sobek as a desperate Hail Mary attempt to try and save humanity before its extinction. Elizabeth and a handful of other scientists created an automated terraforming system to shut down the robots and restore life to earth in the distant future. Because of their efforts, people actually live on, but in primitive tribes and they're no longer the dominant species as machines rule the land. And this is where we find ourselves six months after completing Horizon Zero Dawn, where Aloy travels west from her homeland to a new frontier called the Forbidden West. And this is because of a collapsing biosphere where a phenomenon called the Red Blight infects the lands, choking wildlife, starving people and sending the weather absolutely berserk. Now officially, Sony have stated that Aloy is the only one who can stop the Red Blight with the help of the advanced AI machine Gaia, but to do so, she'll need to explore the ruins of the old ones, which is us by the way, to find technology that can actually sort it all out. So that's our mission, but of course there is a lot more to do than just stopping the Red Blight in this game. In fact, the Forbidden West Frontier is based on the geographical area which extends from modern day Utah in the USA all the way to the Pacific Ocean, which is approximately around 700 miles, roughly the size of the UK for context. Now, Matisse de Jong, the game director of Forbidden West, went on to say that the map is a little bit bigger than Zero Dawn, but in general, we've looked at increasing the density and adding more content, making sure there's a lot more to do for the player across the map. Incidentally, the narrative director, Ben McCaw, stated that the game is based around exploration, and that really is the theme of the game here, which is encouraging, as even if we did want to fast travel across the map, Matisse has said that the new PS5 SSD provides us with the next to no loading screens in Forbidden West, which is really great to hear. And another exciting upgrade inbound is traversal and climbing. The lead systems designer at Gorilla, David McCullen, said that Aloy can climb freely on and across huge sections of different terrain, with a traversal system less restrictive comparatively to the first game, meaning that we can climb freely across the dense world vertically and also submerge ourselves in underwater ruins, opening up a whole new aspect of game exploration. And if we combine that with discovering modern day landmarks, which you may recognize in real life as well, I am very excited. Now there's nothing that can kill that excitement quicker than a big map with lots of fetch quests in it. Well, good news because Gorilla have confirmed that they've spent a lot of time focusing on engaging side quests that offer rewards and are actually worth your time. Matisse, the game director, said there's a lot more variety in that sense. You can actually get something cool in return for doing these quests where you can get a weapon or outfit that's actually useful for your next quest or activity. But what was also encouraging to hear is that Gorilla said that Forbidden West will have a big focus on spending more time with key characters characters in the main story as well as the side quests, meaning that they don't just disappear after one quest and you never see them again in the game. And we can kind of see that their presence has definitely been emphasized in the trailers so far, which makes sense because Anne Katain, senior writer for Forbidden West, said Aloy cannot face everything alone and she needs to rely on her companions in the game. So expect as a player,
player, lots more character development and missions here, specifically around Erend and Vol, who have already been confirmed to be playing significant roles in the sequel, according to Gorilla. Now, alongside these side quests, we're going to be able to play a game within the game. It's called Strike, and we don't actually know too much about it yet, but it's played with carved wooden and metal pieces that are shaped into machines, where Aloy will be able to challenge different NPCs to a match. And I can see this being very similar to Orlog in Assassin's Creed Valhalla, which has gone down really well with the community and actually turned into a real life board game. So let's see if the same happens here. Now, some of you Far Cry 6 enthusiasts may find this new mechanic somewhat familiar. The workbench has been added to Forbidden West, and according to the lead combat designer, Dennis Zopfi, the workbench will be where you upgrade and strengthen your weapons and outfits. You can unlock new perks, mod slots, skills, and more customization options. Now, these workbenches will be distributed around the frontier at different settlements where multiple items will have a variety of different upgrade tiers. The most interesting thing here, though, is that individual armor sets or outfits will have specific skills or abilities that you'll be able to unlock when you upgrade them. So if you like a specific outfit, which let's say prioritizes stealth, it seems that you're going to be able to fully upgrade that gear for a solid stealth build with stealth centric enhancements. Now that doesn't mean that we're going to have to visit the workbench every time we want to craft some arrows. The quick crafting mechanic and weapon wheel remains here in Forbidden West from Zero Dawn. However, this workbench will allow us a bigger degree of customization within a specific playstyle that each gear piece offers us, and I think that is a very big positive. But what's also positive is the Forbidden West game giveaway I'm running at the moment. You just need to be a subscriber of the channel and like the video to show you support, and the link to enter is in the pinned comments down below. So good luck. Now let's talk about abilities, skills, and tools, because there's a lot of cool new ones here in this sequel. Let's first start with the pull caster tool. There's two separate functions to it. The first one being a grapple mechanic, which allows us to traverse the environment quickly or throw ourselves into the air so we can either use our bow, glide, or use the shield wing tool to actually set ourselves up for a very nice assassin strike from above. Now the second function is a winch, meaning that we'll be able to move and destroy objects in the environment, such as pulling a loot chest from a ledge or opening up a vent, so Sony say, which is pretty cool. Next up on our list though is the shield wing tool, designed to really incorporate a lot of verticality in exploration and combat. You can land on your mount with it, jump off tall points in the game to get down quickly, or again, use it to strike from above, and I honestly cannot wait to use this one in particular. Now thirdly, we have our diving mask, which will allow us to stay completely submerged in the water for as long as we want, providing us with that option to plan a pathway around several ambivious machines who are potentially searching for us. We can also boost through the water via these underwater currents, which I think is a really nice touch. On top of all that though, our focus scanner now highlights spots that allow for free climbing in the open world, so we don't actually have to look for specific climbing markers like we did in Zero Dawn, which I think is another real positive addition. But a big revamp here is the skill tree. It has been overhauled and completely restructured to promote and enhance different playstyles. Gorillas say there's six new skill tree paths with 20 to 30 skills per tree, which we can choose to align with depending upon our preferred playstyles, such as a serious focus on stealth or range abilities, just as an example. Now, you may want to sling a few of those skill points in the stealth tree, as Forbidden West is full of tribes that won't take too kindly to us swanning around in their territory. And we've actually got five tribes or factions here. We've got the Osaram and the Kaja, who do make a reappearance from Zero Dawn. But as we travel past their border, we come across the Utaru tribe in Plainsong. Their land is rich with fertile plains and their society is heavily based around agriculture. They believe that those who die are returned to the soil and will nourish the land. And this is also where the red blight we spoke about earlier is the most prominent. Our next tribe is the Tenact, who appear to be one of the more hostile tribes that are comprised of three unique clans, which despite previous hostilities towards one another, are now unified against a split-off group of rebels who have learned to tame the machines. And they're led by Regala, their leader, and I'm sure our friend from the first game is somehow involved there. Now, Regala is fixated on wiping out the Kaja tribe and anyone else who seems to get in her way. Definitely one of our antagonists to look out for, as Gorilla have already confirmed that she will be a major boss fight. Now, for our fifth tribe, they're described as a very mysterious faction that is stronger than Regala's machine-wielding tribe. Perhaps the advanced humans who stowed away on the Odyssey ship to escape the catastrophe are responsible here, but we're just going to have to wait and see. Now let's go over some of the new machine additions to the game that we know of so far. And first of all, let's start with the Tremor Tusk. It can be found in the wild, but it's even more dangerous when it's outfitted by Regala's tribe. And I don't know about you, but I'm picking up serious Lord of the Rings vibes with this, and I genuinely cannot wait to turn Legolas mode on and give these encounters a good go. Now, another standout machine here is the Slither Fang, which spits out poisonous venom and will be a whirlwind boss fight, I have no doubt of. Speaking of which, lead AI 
AI programmer Arjen Bej said that as you're fighting machines, we wanted to make sure that the AI was searching for opportunities to take shortcuts to try and re-engage and best you. And an example of that would be machines chasing Aloy underwater when they're predominantly land-based machines. And we can kind of see this here with the claw striders as they try and search for Aloy, which I think is super cool. Additionally, chargers, snap mauls, and tornecks will be returning in Forbidden West with a pterodactyl flying machine called the Sunwing ruling the skies. You may have also seen the shell snapper doing the rounds at the moment, which is a giant tortoise with a huge protective shell that is dangerous, especially in the water, and clamber jaws who are baboon-like machines that are highly agile and attack en masse in groups. Now, what is clear here is there is a huge amount of variety. I've only just mentioned a few there, and I honestly cannot wait to get stuck in and figure out what is the best way to actually defeat them all. But to defeat them, we're going to need some new weapons, and that's exactly what we've got here. Gorilla's lead combat designer, Dennis Soppy, described the new spike thrower as a high damage weapon, which when thrown at the right moment, makes it a lot easier to do serious damage to larger targets. And I'm all for this new javelin throwing mechanic. Next up, we've got the Valor Surge, which can be unlocked by working through Aloy's skill tree. There's a total of 12 Valor Surges to unlock, which can be upgraded and produce a one-off customizable or powerful attack. Now to produce this attack, we'll need to fill up an energy bar which is done by accumulating experience, scoring headshots with our bow, and removing specific armor pieces off machines. And after it's charged, pretty much came on, and I would compare this to the Supremo mechanic in Far Cry 6, which we've seen recently, which is to be used every now and then, but when you do use it, it's incredibly impactful in-game. Now, Dennis also went on to say that they wanted to bring melee and range combat closer together in this sequel. And a good example of this is the Resonator Blast, where you can charge up the spear with melee hits, and when it's fully powered up, the energy can then be placed or stuck onto enemies to then be followed up with some sort of arrow shot which does huge damage as you can see here really cool combo stuff now of course we do see the return of the weapon wheel with the familiar hunter sharpshooter bow and blast link which now has an adhesive grenade to slow enemies smoke bombs will also be implemented and available in game and i'm a little bit salty about that because i wish we could bring these back in assassin's creed they're great fun and i can't wait to use them here now one of the main focus points that influenced all combat decisions for forbidden west was an increased player choice according to Dennis, Gorilla's lead combat designer. This choice mechanic has actually been applied and implemented on absolutely everything, including melee, weapons, outfit skills, and new mechanics, meaning that we can really decide on how we want to play against the enemies and the game in general. In fact, in Zero Dawn, humanoid and machine encounters were largely very separate, but in Forbidden West, they've been fused together where machines and humans can now fight and search together in groups to try and defeat or find Aloy. Interestingly, the NPC team leader who's directing the search to find Aloy in this example, will throw out a lot of vocal clues to the search party, allowing us time to figure out what our next combative maneuver is. Additionally, audio clues from all enemies will help us distinguish between a melee or ranged attack, which will be particularly useful when multiple machines are surrounding us and screen movement becomes very taxing on the eyes. There's also several armor sets that have been teased throughout the trailers, such as the awesome Shield Weaver armor reappearing here from Zero Dawn, but no official names or stat breakdowns yet for the other other new ones apart from the armor sets that we can see on the pre-order game editions that being the Nora Legacy, Kaja Behemoth and the Nora Thunder Elite outfits. They all do look great though and I can't wait to get some more info about them hopefully in the next couple weeks. But if you haven't already by the way do subscribe for more Horizon videos just like this and come join our awesome Discord community of over a thousand people. It would be great to see you here and talk about everything Horizon. I'll pop the invite link down below in the pinned comments as well. I also want to say a big thank you to the Reloads researchers who helped make this video possible. You guys are the absolute best and I'm looking forward to making more with you. Anyway, hopefully catch you in the next video and as usual, coffee is on me.